Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, we have a good friend of mine today, uh, Greg Carey. Uh, we met through SU, and we have somebody that's quite a rare beast uh, today in terms of uh, been employed, been an entrepreneur, uh, co-founded uh, businesses, been employed and now finding a new adventure. So a real tapestry of, of history. So welcome, Greg. Yeah, Ross. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always fun to chat with you. And so thanks for inviting me into the, the conversations around adaptability that you guys are driving. Uh, cool. We're going to have some fun. You know, I have some really great memories of uh, our time together, even uh, just before covid our trip to Phoenix, uh, where we spent some time with with Chris Voss uh, in in workshops of how to deal with negotiation and things like that, with some some good times. And uh, you've surprised me today with those that are watching uh, the video. We'll see, but those that are listening, we uh, uh, if you know Greg, this is a new look for Greg. T tell people about your new look and what brought this on. Yeah, I mean, I've I've had a a beard. A beard a for a long, long time. Beard. And so, uh, you know, with, uh, with the requirement of wearing a mask now, if you, the bigger your beard, the, the more challenging that is. And my wife has, who's been sewing masks, so, you know, she's an artist and a maker. Um, you know, she's been letting me know that, that masks actually are, are almost receptacles for like, there's more places for germs to sit. Right. And so the mask doesn't fit. And so I, uh, you know, I, I, I did something almost, Traumatic, pretty traumatic for my four-year-old daughter. I, I wiped it off. She saw a new face. Um, she loves me again. She was about a 12-hour period where it was touch and go. Didn't want anything to do with me, but uh, I got my quarantine mustache now. So a bit, uh, Very nice. bit of an interesting nice. look, but um, sitting with it for now. Cool. So what, give us a little bit of um, maybe your journey. Some of the highlights, as I mentioned, you know, you've led teams, uh, your latest role that you had was the MD of Exponential Leadership and Education at Singularity University. Prior to that, you've had lots of involvement in mergers and acquisitions, in people operations. Just give us a flavor of, of your journey uh, for, the, for people to get a picture of you. Yeah, and, and you know what, I think as it unfolds and, and there's more years behind it, the, a theme starts to emerge. Um, and that theme happens to just be very relevant in today's world, right? Especially with the pandemic, like the, the narrative around uncertainty is, is larger than ever, uh, ever. And if I kind of go back and map to like, you know, post-college, I was working with a company called Sapient, um, who we were doing kind of internet consulting actually back in the day. So we were the, helping Fortune 500 companies with their first uh, foray into the internet. What does this mean, right? Online banking, retail experiences. We were getting break, breakout rooms, trying to figure out how you do simple things like a password reset, like banging our head. How do we do this? How do we solve this, right? There were so many unknowns. Um, after that, where I really kind of developed my professional shop, uh, chops around, you know, getting things done, project management, ethnographic research, understanding the user. How do you design for the screen by understanding what's happening around the screen? Uh, kind of leverage that momentum into scratching that itch of, of starting a company. And I started a company called Voxy with uh, a good friend of mine, which has its own challenges. I say most friendships are based around celebrating the good times and being a shoulder, you know, of support when needed. But uh, this starting a business together or marriage, right, really tests who you are in, in ways. And we started a company uh, that built technology to, um, to teach people English and we used uh, this, this mobile device. What, what does this unlock as an education tool? What does um, you know, machine learning allow us to do in terms of building a personalized curriculum, which is incredibly you know, important for, um, you know, for, for learning, it's about the individual. Uh, so a lot of unknowns, right? And then I worked with a company that was trying to make a migration from a, a ad-based marketplace to a transaction-based marketplace in the wedding space. Um, and that was a new thing that was being unlocked because of the network of the internet and the, 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 the things that people can kind of provide when coming together. Um, and then I made a move to, um, to Singularity um, and was there for the, the last four years, which was really a convergence of all the uncertainty, 
right? You saw it happen on the, a couple of different fronts in terms of the, uh, the internet and mobile. Those were like the first, you know, the forefront of startups and everything. Now it's getting bigger. It's the convergence of all these technologies and breaking down industries and rebuilding them back up. Um, and Singularity helped me be in the center of all that, you know, in terms of what is that the thought leadership out there, the, the network of faculty, just being around them was fascinating. Uh, and, and helping some of these companies solve these incredibly big challenges of navigating this, this disruptive change. Um, so again, with, with each of those, it's really like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I'm doing until I dive in. And then you realize, oh, a lot of people don't know what they're doing. And if you can be confident in knowing that not everyone knows what they're doing, that can actually give you the confidence to then have breakthroughs and learn new things and then get ahead be ahead of that curve because you're it's a wave right and you're you're on top of it surfing and you're learning kind of how to ride that wave so i think it's a really important point you raised there about this being comfortable in the unknown and being uh, able to have vulnerability to say i don't know that's what learning yeah. is right <laughs> Learning is 100%. discovering the answers. And so in order 100%. to learn, you have to first say, I don't know. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. I want to, before we uh, dig a bit more into perhaps some of your roles and experiences and lessons in Singularity University, is coming back to the half dozen years of in the startup. Mm -hmm. So in Voxy, what was it like, um, you know, at the early stages what were some of the things you learned along that way as the business scaled uh, and some of the observations of how both you as a person and the team and the organization kind of had key moments of change? Maybe just give us a, a historical look back at that journey um, and any lessons that we could perhaps uh, pick up from the journey that you had there. Yeah, well, you know, I think out of the gates, we we had the benefit of being naive. Um, and that caused us to kind of think about problems in new ways, which maybe, you know, a, an expert may have never really jumped to those conclusions, right? And so that gave the room for, for innovation, right? And so we were doing some really cool things, you know, I won't get into like the technology, but just that theme of being naive and, and not really knowing you were naive, gave you the confidence to kind of say, oh yeah, can we do that? I don't know, can we do that? Let's try it, let's try it, right? We eventually brought in expertise to help with like the fundamentals of learning and making sure that there were principles behind it. But the, the merge of, of, the, of being naive and balanced with like that expertise was an important part of, of what was going on. Um, the other thing was that we were embarking on a, a business that was disruptive. And there was this kind of, and I have a few stories and anecdotes around this, but when you're just starting, there's this, this, this tendency to kind of look outside and look behind your back and see what is the competition doing. And I've found that always to be an incredible, just unproductive distraction because the one, the execution, the idea serves no purpose. It's, it is all in your ability to execute. And if you're not aligned yourself with being on that own learning journey and paying attention to the customer and you drawing those conclusions, you start to break down like the trust of your ability to like solve the right problems by hearing other, you know, other ideas and stuff. And so the very kind of ingredients that are required to be successful as a startup, which is listening to the customer, trusting your gut and your intuition, they get distracted by noise, right? And I think that that's something that a trap that we all often fall into in large corporate environments um, in st startup mode, where this whole game is about your own learning journey and how, your own intuition and you want to be customer focused, right? And so we, being inexperienced entrepreneurs, we're trying to look for influence all around us, you know, by our mentors and, and by competition, by venture capitalists. And the real magic happens when you have a strong vision 
strong principles and strong value and you're unwavering in that and let that be the driving force to unlock great discoveries. Um, I think one of the things that fascinates me in this, you know, innovation coming from naivety, but principle led and having a commitment to go and discover you created an organization there. I mean, was it, it was over a hundred people that you uh, grew that organization to finding that talent, onboarding that talent, you know, working remotely for many of them in multiple locations. And then also, correct me if I'm wrong, you were recognized as one, you know, top place to work, uh, you know, by a couple of different things as best place to work in New York or top 10 tech startups best to work in. How did you do that? What were the, some of the key, um, you know, methods or principles or things? Was it by accident? Was it by design? Did you have the ambition to say, oh, we want to be the best place to work and therefore we did it intentionally? Tell us a little bit more about that scaling of people, managing the people and getting it to be a great place to work. Yeah, well, first of all, we were fortunate enough to be in a position where we had the opportunity to like think about that stuff. Because in the very early days, like we did not know, it took us, you know, three tries before where we hired the right CTO. Neither me nor my business partner were, um, you know, tech focused. So on day one, we get, you know, we get our venture capital. We start, we look around the room and we're like, can you build anything? No. Can you build anything? We have to hire that person. And we didn't even have the competency to hire that right person because we didn't know what that profile looked like. And this was in 2009, a very, very different world back then where, you know, the technologies and, and the, the options of which paths you could do, like, you know, you didn't have things like, um, you know, these crowds, uh, open sourced, you know, t toolkits to work from. Um, but eventually through perseverance and just being like, you know, we, we are doing this, right? There's now no option to like stop. We've clicked, we've gotten outside money. We, we are moving. We have accountability. We have skin in the game. Um, we were able to get a little momentum, right? And it took a lot of time to find the right person, find the right person. Once we started to get to, you know, like eight to 12 people crammed in a small room, um, you know, three people per table, knocking knees, people not even paying for people's computers and some having horrible internet. We just started to kind of think about what our values were, right? And we, we actually set out to be like, how can we be, you know, a great place to work, right? With a goal of being recognized for that, right? So setting that as a goal um, certainly helped us then define that. And we, then we thought about, okay, well, how do we do that, right? And it starts, it starts with that talent acquisition process. What's the experience and touch point when people are coming into the uh, organization to meet us? So being very thoughtful with our applicant tracking system, uh, with training and onboarding the, the people that we'll be interviewing. Um, the onboarding process was so incredibly important, right? And and we also, we found in the early days when we were like, hey, you're hired, you start no formal onboarding. You spend three, four, six months, like just trying to like calibrate. Whereas if you take that time, right? Talk about highly leveraged time, like I, sit down and what is that job expectation from day one? Right. What is that job expectation for what day one and really empower them? Then all of a sudden you shift the dynamic where here's the goals, here's the guidance. You help us fill in the blanks, right? There's managed incredible management leverage that you, you get from, um, from that point. Um, and you know, what else was there? Um, what were some of the mistakes you made? You know, you mentioned that it took you three times to find the right CDO um, you got to a point where you felt, ah, eight to 12 people, we want to set a goal to be a great place to work. Even when you set that and you put this leverage time into getting a slick onboarding, getting people able to do their best work and provide the environment to that, what else went wrong, you know, in that journey um, that potentially you could then think about differently for the leadership that's required now? Yeah. Oh man. I mean, so much goes wrong. I mean, and that's kind of part of it. It's like an assumption that, Oh, when you're on this journey, things going wrong 
is actually how things go, right? And it's the ability to course correct and figure out what that learning was so that you're adapting that new approach, right? So the expectation that, hey, things aren't gonna go wrong, we're gonna do this perfect, actually creates angst, frustration, and blinds you to, to what the real lessons are in this learning and iterative process. Um, you know, but we did, you know, we had some trouble. I think we, you know, early on, we were probably, we weren't as diverse in our, our, our thinking. You know, diversity wasn't as big of a like concept then. And I think we, our hiring profile by just our own maybe insecurities or, or um, comfort, you know, insecurity and comfort, we, we hired people that, we, you know, we thought kind of like fit rather than like, you know, and we've talked about this, a cultural ad. Right. And so then then it started to just kind of create like a, a, a tone that wasn't as, as welcoming as as we would want it. We then kind of shift. And, you know, by the time I left, you know, we had um, the management team was you know 50 percent women. The company was 50 percent women, a lot of a lot of minorities. Um, I think we, you know, we we we, we had a lot of hiccups of letting of trying to micromanage at times, you know, feeling that feeling the burden of uh, raising capital and the, the stress that comes with that, and maybe you know projecting stress on to the employees when they don't have the full context. It's not their company; they're not going to really put in as much time as you are, right? And coming to terms with that allows you to just get more just appreciate where they're you're going to meet them at rather than setting this unrealistic realistic expectation. And I think another big thing is that, you know, it is, it is a marathon. There's not like one good rollout that's going to like, you know, make or break your company, right? It is a series of good behaviors. It's a series of, of commitment and discipline of learning. And we got caught up at times in putting so much pressure on these releases thinking that this was the moment, this was the turning point, um, and then being let down, right? Because it, it wasn't big fireworks, right? Whereas that tone, the cadence, um, you know, the constant learning is what needed to kind of fuel the reward rather than a milestone launch. Let the curiosity, let the learning fuel that fire, let, the, let that empower and provide you know, satisfaction for your team and not the big launches that come with a reward, but the way that we work, the way that we learn. Um, you know, I think we, we try to like, you know, put so much pressure and, and kind of create a, a diamond out of the situation. And that's just not how it works. There's no, but no and the, the system, the ecosystem is set up so that success does not rely on getting lucky or one big break. It's on a pattern of behaviors that you can demonstrate over time. Because there will be, there is one test after another. It's interesting this concept of, you know, pattern of behaviors that then result in success. And so, in terms of all of these experiences that you've been gathering to shape the kind of human you are, career you have, and the multiple careers you've had in your portfolio, being then inside SU as an educational organization that's helping people understand what exponentials are, what the concept is, how to navigate that pace of change and how do leaders show up. What have you, what have you learned in the last sort of four years in that kind of role of what organizations are doing well to deal with that? What are those behaviors? <laughs> you know, what are those things that they have put in place that show um, the new world of leaders in an exponential world, because we are all feeling it now, right? The, the pace of change is accelerating. How do leaders now do well in that environment? What, what can you share uh, from your experiences of advice in that? Well, I think, you know, I would answer the que a different question, kind of like, not what are people doing well, but a recognition that like, no one's really doing it well, right? Like take that in, like no one's really doing it well. It's so hard. And the constant theme is, is, you know, oh, what, the uncertainty, the, the disruption, the change, what do we do? What do we do? And it, 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 what it happens, it drives a conversation to like look outward, right? To look at expertise, 
to try to like give some type of comfort around what path they go for, which they take, right? Which assumes that someone knows better. But in a time of rapid disruption, the ability to respond or the, or the val validity of expertise, it like condenses, right? And so someone that's been doing something for 15 years in a world that's rapidly changing is almost dangerous or irrele irrelevant sometimes. So what I've, I like to encourage people, and I think is important during this stage is, is to say, like, no one's, we're all in this you know, global pandemic, like talk about like a hard reset on a new normal, right? Where we're forced into being adaptive. Like everyone's asking questions. Everyone, no one knows how to figure it out, right? Everyone's making mistakes. But what that leader is doing, and be, the leader that's being successful in that is the one that has an awareness about that and isn't scared to have the right answer, but is curious, curious to find out the right answer on their own. So maybe this concept of the expertise and the knowledge being the leaders to the ones that are able to ask questions, able to provide the environment that allows questions to be asked even in the first place and yeah. to experiment with discovering an answer rather than looking to someone who already has it. So maybe that's exactly. the shift that we're facing right now is that because the context is changing so rapidly, um, you know, a, a good friend of ours, another SU uh, faculty, Barry O'Reilly in his book and work about unlearning, it's yep. exactly that, right? You can be too dangerous with too much knowledge. So maybe yeah. the new leaders are the ones that can let go the quickest. Um, and that brings us on to, you know, this uh, shift from maybe upskilling to reskilling and the concept of now it's not just layering in what you had before and making it a bit better. It's doing something entirely different yeah. in a whole yep. new way and embracing that. And if you could look at, you know, taking, you know, this balance between data and analysis from the behind to try and predict how to turn up in uncertain times. What are some of the essential things that you have seen in organizations alongside asking questions, being experimental? Where has it worked well? You know, perhaps you could share a story of organizations you've worked with, um, where you've helped with their executive leadership programs and things that has landed value to ensure they remain relevant um, and that they can thrive through periods of change. Uh, be great to hear some examples of where that's uh, worked or maybe if it hasn't worked, you know, there's some stories of, of where it's failed, you know, either or. Yeah. I, just going back to our last conversation too, to just kind of, just kind of summarize a the point there, like instead of thinking that you have to have the answer, you have to actually find the answer. Right. And that's go, like a shift. Discover. I got to find yep. the answer. No, you have to go find the answer because only through finding it can you get the answer, right? And you gotta break the barrier of, I gotta look elsewhere for an expert. No, you have to be on a quest to find the answer. Um, in terms of, you know, some of the things that we've been doing, I wasn't working too closely on like the data side of things. I was working more on like the, the leadership, the, um, helping leaders to reestablish a new mindset and mental model to kind of move forward and, and kind of adapt these things like unlearning and, and thinking about value in an exponential way. Whereas um, you so often, you know, especially in the SU world, we think about exponentiality in the terms of technology and the rapid advances, right? What we were working on, on the leadership programs that I was building with some great colleagues was how do you think about value business value in terms of exponentiality. Um, so I was working a lot with, uh, with Mark Bonchek of uh, Shift Thinking, who does some tremendous work on the appropriate mindset, right? The appropriate mi mindset required to kind of shift thinking. So if you actually like tiered it, you know, first step is getting that exponential value mindset in place, right? Then- it's, What does that the look next like? What is an exponential yeah. mindset? Yeah, so we, with Mark, uh, we defined six kind of criteria of what um, what drives exponential thinking, right? What drives exponential thinking? And some of those were, um, you know, a a um, 
like a network-based business model versus a pipeline based business model, right? And how do you kind of build a, a marketplace and think about value? Um, another example was fr from a management perspective, right? We used a starlings, these birds that fly as though they're a school of fish, as an example of management, where if you look at those starlings and you say, who's, who's the leader? There's no leader, right? But leadership is an attribute of the system where each bird is empowered to kind of make their own decisions based on a set of inputs. And together, they have great leadership as a community, right? And they, they have three simple rules, you know, stick together, uh, follow the neighbor and, you know, don't hate each other or something. I forget what they are now. But those three behaviors create a synchronicity in, in kind of helping them to evade prey, to feed for themselves, right? Um, and you can look at that and say, wow, talk about like, you know, exponential leadership, like you're getting the coordination and support through a set of principles. Now, if you say, okay, birds, nature, what about humans? Okay, well, now let's look at military, right? Military, a very hierarchical organization, right? But in the fog of war, where you don't have the time to actually call up the ranks and say, hey, what should I do? They get trained on doctrine and very clear principles of when in this situation, I respond like this. And that those collective behaviors over time help to orchestrate a great, you know, go to war strategy, right? That, that kind of builds up to their, their, their guiding principles, right? And so you can build those, those kind of that doctrine within an organization, even if it has hierarchy, right? Like the military to respond to this fog of business that we're about to be in. Because one thing that will certainly cripple a company is trying to maintain the hierarchical decision-making in times of rapid change, right? So, you know, there's a, other principles. Mark Bonchek's shift thinking is like the, the thought leader on this space. Um, but that was like, first, let's get the right mindset about how to think about value in an exponential world, right? And then you can tier that, okay, then say, when you have the right mindset, then you can apply like the design thinking to be customer focused to designing the solution. And then you can apply agile uh, in terms of that, um, you know, the agility required when building stuff, right? So you got the mindset, you got the design, and then you got the, um, the execution. So those are kind of like the three layers that are, we're starting to emerge with some of the work that we were doing with Mark. So once you've got this framework of mindset, um, as a principle for the new way leaders need to start. They need to reorientate a mindset of exponential thinking, whether that's in, you know, the fog of war or uncertainty and rapid change, whether that's in hierarchy versus in these situations, we need to execute at a much quicker pace. Therefore, these are the principles. How much of that was um, either in somebody and innate? They are someone who can cope with having an exponential mindset. And how much of it was, no matter what raw material you had of a leader, could you help them gain an exponential mindset? Is this something that people can acquire with focus, with effort, with learning? Um, what was your experience with that? Yeah, um, I think it is something that you can acquire. I think adapting is being human right and and we've just have been living within a, a structure and a system which has relied on consistency of behavior of normalcy of behavior companies tried to reduce risk by normalizing behavior and now that same strategy creates risk into the system because now they can't move right so i believe we have it in us and that is the first like belief that needs to be kind of accepted it is in us, right? It is absolutely in us. And one of the ways that we kind of unlocked that was through, um, you know, just creating such a compelling, optimistic, entertaining story filled with epiphanies where there was a light bulb that went off, right? And so these were carefully choreographed um, experiences that, that dealt with a lot of emotions, right? Where you would kind of build up that fear and almost get to the point where I can't do it, but then unlock something that, that actually was their own thought. And the magic in all, all do, doing all of this 
is is distilling it down into like the simplicity so that it can become theirs right the program if, if, if it becomes some overly complicated you know management structural leadership you know model uh that people have to bang their head against that creates friction within a you know individual and then magnifying that across an organization right so the ability to simplify that story so they can adopt it as their own then gives them the empowerment to be that oh i can do that right with the, the back it also needs to be backed by incredible empowerment optimism so that then they build the enthusiasm to drive the commitment so i would say at the highest level our core objective of these programs was to build incredible enthusiasm for one to transform themselves because if you could bottle that enthusiasm that becomes the fuel to move forward you could have all the tools and the guidance and and you know the the theory but if you don't have the enthusiasm you can't get out of the gates right so how do you build the enthusiasm so that this becomes something that like oh i want to be part of this future and i want to redefine myself within that future so i guess it's connecting with the triggers on an individual basis of what the what will in you know excite them to transform so for some you know i've talked about this uh you know a burning platform versus a burning ambition and we might need a bit of both depending on the time and context so as a leader recognizing when someone needs a burning platform and when someone needs burning ambition and to allow them to connect with the the dance between those two things to transform ourselves with optimism and hope you know that's something that as as humans uh i feel a, a leader whether that's i'm a leader in these days and these hours to myself or it's someone in my organization is to have a connection to a, a better future you know that's yeah. what we want to be able to create manifesting first in our mind <laughs> And then in our thoughts and our behaviors and actions that, that then respond in terms of this, you know, one thing I've observed having run, you know, multiple businesses over the last two decades is this change in this concept, you know, of exponential, oh, we're in an exponential world. So everything's speeding up the pressure that that brings to do things quickly and the, you know, the adapt or die, don't change quick enough. You're going to become irrelevant. You know, my job's going to go, my company's going to go. And hey, we've had this big shock hit wave of a reset with COVID where many people will be going back into their organizations and everything's going to look different. What they do, how they do it, they're going to be looking to each other for that support. And what um advice would you give leaders in those environments that are coming back into uh, a world that is entirely different and changed how do they face that is it the same stuff you've been talking about is it you know go in knowing you don't have the answers is it creating hope and optimism is it the same things that you've just been talking about or are there other bits where they need to have the broad shoulders and say we've got it a bit like you said um you know just talking this through in my own mind when you had the company and the pressure between having to raise new funds and then employees that's not part of what they need to have to deal with on a daily basis you have to take that responsibility on because that's your role and so that you meet them where they are is there an element of leadership coming back where we need to take some of this on on behalf of them or do we need to shed bear what's your view on that i mean the anchor that i use to always come back to this stuff is like what's the most human thing to do, right? What's the most human thing to do, recognizing like the context of the situation. And I think if you get too much, right, when people come back to work or there's like some phase kind of situation where half the employees are going back and half are staying at home to maintain social distance, think about what that means from a human standpoint, right? And that, that usually helps to be just a good, like anchor or centerpiece to, to guide and lead from. I was speaking with, uh, with a, a friend of mine who's an executive in a you know, Fortune 50 financial services company, um, C-suite. And one of the, the things that I thought was so interesting, which he kind of used to prioritize the, the, the majority of our conversation was 
the importance of mental health. And if you start like skipping these like basics that are core uh, to being human, the reality is like we're in the middle of a global pandemic. There's incredible uncertainty. Um, people are working from home while parenting, which is a disruption of, of personal and professional lives. And you don't know what people, you know, you, there used to be a very clear divide. I go to work at eight o'clock and I get to, you know, leave everything at home for eight hours and come back. That's not happening now, right? We're starting to drive a higher, like, kind of acceptance and breaking the stigma around mental health. But like, if anything is going to accelerate some of the anxiety, of what it's like to, you know, go through this adaptive world and uncertainty, you know, it, it's leaders that recognize just the mental health situation. Because if your employees aren't feeling, you know, safe, if they're not taking care of themselves, if they're not sleeping, if the stresses from at home are, are there and real and like side by side next to their Zoom call, like that is the reality that is happening for so many people right now. And so I think for these next, you know, three, six months, a year, whatever it is, like that needs to be one of the top priorities because if you don't solve that, if you don't address it, anything else that you try to do is a waste of time because we're humans. We're humans and we need to uh, address the rea reality of that situation. That, that concept of, you know, psychological safety and being able to perform, we need support to do that. And I think it's a really astute point that you've made there of there's going to be a lot of panic at every level in the organization. And addressing that is going to be critically important. How might, um, you know, when you spoke to this, this chap, were there some things that he was doing, um, you know, initiatives or certain programs? Because um, it's one thing saying, oh, we need to do something about mental health. Well, what is that? You know, where do we start? You know, we've been doing this. Do we do the same thing, but just ramp it up more? Or are there some specific things that you've come across that might be uh, opportunities for, you know, organizations to think about, or even just individuals to think about how they might maintain it. And in order to answer that, um, I want you to think of two things. One is that conversation you had. The second part is you've just gone through a massive transformation, right? Um, Singularity University and your, um, you know, the challenges of their own adapting to the marketplace. You know, a lot of their business model was about in-person. And now they're having to shift that and a lot of the roles have changed. And so what does your future look like? How are you maintaining your own mental health through your own transitions of those things? So I wonder if you could think about it in those two ways. Maybe if there was anything during that conversation example, if not, what about you? That you're yeah. going through lots of transformation and change. How are you dealing with uh, that around the mental health aspects and what's, what's the future look like? Yeah, no. Um, so I think in terms of, you know, what leaders can be doing, I think the, the most important thing is to, to just make it part of a conversation. Like, talk about it. Talk about it, remove stigma, share and be open about your own personal challenges that you may be going with to normalize. Because the, 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 what becomes scary is when, um, you know, when, when we feel alone, right? But if we recognize that the challenge is shared by so many, that that's one you know it's not the the end all but um it's an important part of um of that because when people can be open and share right they, they feel safety that psychological safety so i think that the the thing to do is to talk about it now there's services that companies can provide to kind of layer in you know behind that where professionals can kind of like step in but you got to talk about it openly and regularly and be vulnerable as a leader yourself of sharing what those might mean, right? Because oftentimes people see that leader as so polished, this and that, and you know, that's, that's not the, the expectation, that's not really um, often not true. Um, and just kind of being part of that dialogue too, not, you know, being, being part of it is important. Um, you know, Singularity has gone through some, some, uh, some transformation as well. Uh, and I'm not as close to those solutions right now, but I know that, you know, the majority of, of the business was in-person experiences. 
um, and that is putting a challenge on on the company itself, on the network of our faculty who relied on that ecosystem. Um, and, and you know, for me personally, who is kind of tr who is transitioned out, um, you know, the, there's an initial reaction of okay, like you know, that was there was a paycheck there, right? There was security, um, all things that are you know, especially when you have a, a family, are, are meaningful. Um, I've been trying to be centered around the entrepreneur in me who is thinking, wow, you know, when, when the world is kind of burning down to ashes and rising in whatever form it may take shape, to have a hard reset on that journey is really exciting. It's really exciting to then watch and observe and say, wow, things are going to be very di different. What role can I play? Um, and, you know, use this as like a level, you know, it's a kind of leveling of the playing field that now, like, you know, as I was saying at the beginning, there's, there's no experts around how to like navigate a global pan pandemic in, in you know, the age of connectivity and, and all this. And so that, that is an opportunity to kind of establish yourself, redefine yourself. Um, but the things that, that help me do that are getting a good night's sleep when I can. You know, it's the basics, right? Getting on my Peloton bike. Um, when I'm with my daughter, being present with my daughter. You know, it's, she's, she is the, the arbiter of, of are you connecting with me or not? and there's no wiggle room right and i know that doesn't serve either of us if i'm distracted by other things so there are all those things that are you know as the world is crumbling there's also this like incredible spiritual movement around taking care of our bodies and breathing and, and meditating that is just coinciding with the change that's happening and i think that that is that's not by accident it's those tools that are going to be uh critical for us to come out of this with you know the right kind of level-headed um you know tools that we need to to kind of thrive in this situation right so those that you know 10 years ago those were fringe now that they're, yeah. they're becoming more core which is exciting to, to see for humanity i think there's going to be a lot of people in a similar situation of where they're redefining their future and there's going to be fear and acknowledge that, you know, there's going to be grief of the identity that they were and built up within their own self identity of their role. Um, I heard a statistic that it takes twice as long to recover from a job loss as it does a relationship loss. And that's frightening for the reality of just how much we're facing potential unemployment, not just a short blip of it, but an extended period. So acknowledging it, and then deciding how do I want to reset? How might I want to show up? Um, is going to be exciting for, for some that have got the right mindset, but also the support network. You know, whether the support network is your young child, you know, your daughter to be able to, you know, the barometer of are you present dad uh, is part of that. Breathing, really critical um, for another, another day and another topic, the impact of how we can improve our resilience through breathing on a chemical level is really fascinating and interesting around our heart rate variability and the connection between heart and mind to be able to make yeah. good decisions and be resilient. Just breathing at five seconds in, five seconds out, and at the same time, visualizing positive things. It might be a relationship. So if you've gone through a challenge, using that technique can reset your chemical makeup uh, to become more resilient. And so I think these kind of techniques, there's going to be more of them. They're going to become uh, discovered. But what I'd love to do is uh, find out what you're doing next. What are some of your plans uh, as it's forming? Some of it, uh, I know you're still figuring out and getting to there, but um, there will be a lot of people that are listening to you that uh, are resonating with what you're talking, but also perhaps excited by your experiences and what uh, you could maybe help them with you know having been the md of exponential leadership and education at su for a long time working with loads of organizations how's that forming for your future how might people get in touch with you and what what would be great for you what are you looking for in terms of your phoenix 
uh, and your offering uh, that, that's coming out. Just share some of those early stage insights um, for us would be lovely to hear. Yeah, no, no, and thanks for the opportunity for this conversation to, to, to share that. So there's kind of two, two big buckets that, uh, that have been playing, when, and I think they both kind of serve each other. One is the, the continuity of this professional journey that I've been on with Singularity, right? I've met incredible people. Um, a lot of what I think and believe is, is the re result of, or is the output of, of relationships that I've been fortunate to, to have. Um, and you know, that ecosystem has just been, been wonderful for my, for my mindset, for my optimism. Um, and there's an opportunity to kind of continue on that path and, and, and to kind of pair that thought leadership with, you know, clients, individuals that are kind of struggling and navigating and, and where I think I serve well is almost this kind of general contractor of the future in a way, right? Because the, the, the concept of expertise kind of has a, a fast kind of expiration date, um, you know, the, the evolving needs of support systems to unlock that talent within an organization becomes kind of critical, right? And how do you stay on, do your job while staying on top of the, the support system required? Um, and I, I see that that's kind of where I, I can play a, a role in terms of helping companies kind of bridge and connect those dots in into the future as they make those decisions um and a lot of it i'm kind of you know this is everyone's still locked in their home right so i'm trying i'm not being overly um purposely not being overly definitive in what that vision and that strategy is i'm purposely being kind of organic and letting conversations kind of flow naturally and and let value kind of you know, go where, where it may. Um, the other thing that I've been doing, which uh, has been an opportunity to really get closer being on you know, an entrepreneur is I've been running my, uh, a friend of mine, e-commerce business. Um, and that allows me to get close to the grit and the reality um, to unlearning, to do it yourself to these things that are, are just becoming more and more important in this narrative of how do we drive this change. And I think, so my like, you know, unique superpower or the ability to kind of help organizations is that, you know, I've been and watched corporations and them struggle and repeat certain behaviors that just kind of try to take best practices of the old. And I've also seen incredible execution with very low resources and sweat and inspiration. And by playing in those two roles, how can you merge together a narrative to help people and organizations get the organizational confidence that you can do a lot with a little? You can do a ton with a little, right? And the e-commerce experience allows me, because I, you know, it's been a while since I've been starting my company and what one person can do today with the tools that compared to five years ago or 10 years ago, you know, and sometimes organizations miss those, org those tools that are available Yep. and think that it's so much bigger and harder, right? So I want to help them help them jump to that that easy start more quickly. We don't know what we don't know, and we can't see what we can't see. And so for you, it, with this eclectic mix of hope and optimism that it's about humans first, um, and then leveraging technology in order for organizations to stay relevant and leapfrog to do more with less. And I think that's a really potent mix, and it's... Uh, I had a vision when you were talking about, um, oh, what I'm doing and defining it is the, the story of sculptors, you know, when they have a rock. And for some, no, no, the, the sculptures inside it, they're just going in to discover it. And that's how they talk yeah. about it rather than, no, I'm making David, you know, or, or whatever it may be. Is no, they were already in there. I'm just yeah. going and discovering it and just getting rid of all the other noise. So yeah. maybe for you, you're at this period of, um, being comfortable with discovering what that is, how you show yeah. up. It's already there. You're just going to go and discover it rather than going, oh, I've got to figure it out. I've got to figure it out. What is my, what is my purpose? What is my vision? And it will come. And being comfortable with that is a real testament to your own, um, you know, comfortable in your own skin. You know you'll provide value. Having conversations with people and listening, asking the right questions is wonderful. I feel 
I feel blessed to be in your orbit, Greg. You know, it, our, our journey has uh, been one that's been filled with joyful moments already, and I know it's going to continue. I know our paths will cross in lots of ways because of the mission that we're doing to make sure no one's left behind to help them adapt, but you're going to be providing lots of value in that, that story and narrative as a, uh, a person involved. So it's been a, a real pleasure. And if someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Is it LinkedIn? Is it email? How might they get in touch with you if they want to reach out? Yeah. You know, LinkedIn is a fine, fine way. Greg Carey, you know, G-R-E-G-G, -G, there's two G's on there. And, but uh, feel free to send me an email to my personal Gmail, greg.e.carry at gmail.com. Um, you know, Twitter, you know, send me a we'll DM We'll put all these links uh, for those that um, can access it yeah, online for these. Great. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I, you know, I love, I love, we're all in this learning process together, right? So part of it is like just asking questions of each other and revealing what we, we can learn. Um, you know, and I, I just want to also thank you. I mean, in a world where, where hugs aren't acceptable right now, you know, I, I've, I knew that, you know, every time we chat, I always take a, you know, um, take a lot away and, and I appreciate always your summation of, of kind of what's, you know, what you're hearing. I mean, that's one of your, your skills to kind of help an in, individual that's kind of going through and just kind of distill it and play back like, a narrative or an analogy. And that's a huge benefit that I take away. So I knew having this conversation, one, it would just be, I'm grateful for the opportunity. But, uh, you know, while I've, I've chatted probably most of the airtime on this thing, um, the snippets of summary, especially in the closing, is, is something that I always take away from our conversations. These Thank you. Nuggets I, to hold on to. I enjoy it. My, one of, and you met Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach. Um, he calls one of my unique abilities the contextualizer and he'll look to me after there's been an hour of conversation by all these great minds and people and, uh, and look to me, put me on the spot to give a five minute kind of summation. And I've kind of fell into it and he says, it just becomes easy for you. You know, you just do it naturally. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess I'm embracing that as part of my uh, identity of my adaption and unique ability to take that on. So it's, it, I'm grateful for your, for your recognition of it. It's been a real joy and I look forward to a time when we can have a hug again um, because I, I, uh, I love my hugs and I'm missing them. And so I'm sending know. one to you and uh, here, bud. look forward to seeing you and speaking to you soon. Thank you so much. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams, and organizations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review, and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.